This meeting is being recorded. Uh, kia ora koutou. Um, we'll start the meeting now. It's uh, the start time. Uh, welcome to this online presentation. I'll just pass to Edward Ellison for a uh, karakia. Hello, David. Warm um, greetings to everyone joining this evening. Uh, here's the karakia for our uh, meeting. E te ariki, te kaihanga, te mātauranga o ngā me kato, tatu mai ki rongo ki a mātau i tēnei rā, ki a kite a ai, ki a mōhi o ai, uh, I ngā me i tō te kai te kato, te tau toko ana e ti aki ana rātou ngā mau iwi, huri noe te motu, uh, e, e roto te tātou i ngā wahi pākanga uh, i Europa. Uh, no tono mai i Wanganui, tau poanga, uh, e pera anō i te tīmatanga, uh, e pera anō i nai nai, so just a few words to bless our uh, meeting, Rem remind ourselves of those who are, uh, who are not well or particularly the people who are suffering heavily in Europe at the moment as we, as we speak uh, and, and seek guidance for our meeting. Kia ora tātou. Kia ora Edward. Uh, Tom, would you mind just bringing up the, uh, the presentation please? Thanks, Tom. So, um, yes, again, thank you very much for, for jumping online. Um, my name is David Cooper. I'll be facilitating the discussion again. Uh, so, just really need to emphasize that we'd rather be meeting you face to face where you're at. Uh, it's, it's not a good platform for having a good two way discussion. So, we're trying to make the best we can. Uh, given the COVID situation, we certainly don't want to start trotting around the region. Uh, risking spreading um, some of the uh, COVID to um, some of our hardworking communities. Uh, there will be, as we'll discuss shortly, there is a strong intention to meet you where you live in late 2022. There will be a further consultation step, and that will be when the rubber really hits the road in terms of the, the discussion around options, trade-offs, etc. So this is an important first step in the process. Uh, as we discuss later on in the presentation, um, there will be another really important step in the process as well, uh, and that will be face-to-face. -face. Tom, could you go to slide two, please? So the purpose of this meeting is to identify your fresh well water values in the Roxborough Rohe, uh, and hear from you, um, from, the, from you the characteristics that contribute to these values. So that, gives us the opportunity to work out what environmental outcomes we need to deliver to provide for those values. And then we bring those environmental outcomes, uh, what we understand we've heard from you, we bring those environmental outcomes back to you uh, further on in the year. So this is a map of the Roxborough Rohe. The red line is very important to this process as we're seeking your feedback on values and characteristics within the area delineated by the red line. Uh, some some confusion um, because the red line does not accurately reflect what some uh, know to be the communities of interest. So I really encourage you to make sure you are aware um, that this is the area we're discussing. Uh, we are having uh, other meetings in other areas um, outside. Uh, and if you have any questions around where those boundaries are, um, why those boundaries are there, uh, please feel free to get in touch. In terms of logistics, I'll run through a few right now. Uh, Important to know that the Zoom session is being recorded and will go up on the IOC's website and YouTube channel for anyone to watch afterwards. The Zoom is set up so that only the person speaking will show up on the screen. Please make sure you're on mute unless we come to you to talk uh, so that it, no background noise interferes with the, the session itself. We will have stops throughout for questions and answers and discussion. Uh, if you have a question, please write it in the chat and you'll notice at the very bottom of the Zoom screen, there is a, a chat box. Um, so please write the question in the chat. I'll collate the questions as we go through. 
pause the present presentation or presenter every now and then to answer some of those questions and have a bit of a discussion around those questions as well. If you want to say something when we're going through the Q&A session, please use the hand icon uh, and I'll come to you. And again, the hand icon is at the bottom of the Zoom box uh, with the wee smiley face, um, the emo emotions. There may be times when I cut a conversation short. I want to stress this is not an attempt to shut you down. Uh, we've had feedback from the two previous meetings that some of the questions and our responses really get into very specific technical territory. Uh, and we want to encourage a range of input from a range of people. And we heard from uh, some people that um, going too deep into some of this technical detail did put them off A, speaking uh, and B, listening. So we will have that, uh, that fine balance uh, throughout this meeting. And again, very happy to have more detailed discussions outside of this meeting with you. Uh, and we will provide our contact details. You may also have questions or comments that are outside the Land and Water Regional Plan. If the best person to answer your question isn't on this meeting, we will take your details and get back to you. And our project manager, Rachel Curry, is here to help via text message, particularly if you're having issues with the, uh, the Zoom call. And she has provided her uh, cell phone in the, in the chat. So you should see that there. Uh, if you have any issues, please flip that text. Uh, in terms of the introductions, uh, Edward Ellison uh, is Mana Whenua representing Otako and Kaitahu Kiyotago. Uh, we have Sandra McIntyre and Maria Bartlett working for Okaha and Te Ao Marama, uh, and they're working to support the Mana Whenua role in the development of the Land and Water Regional Plan. And we have Tom de Pelsmaker, who is the face you will see most often. Uh, he is about to kick into the, um, the presentation itself. Um, but what we'll do is start with uh, Edward Ellison, if you wouldn't mind introducing the Mana Whenua perspective. Hello, David, thank you. Um, yes, Kaitahu are happy to be working in partnership with the Regional Council on this Land and Water Regional Plan, particularly, of course, bringing in our values and cultural perspectives, in, which includes water being a central element of our Kaitahu traditions, being the foundation and source of all life, and it was present very early in the whakapapa, as we see it, of the world. And, in fact, the source of Modi, which you may have heard of. Following that, those creation events um, in our traditions, demigods, including Rangi Nui and Papa Tuanuku, who you may have heard of, and their 80 or so children were involved and intertwined in some fantastic legends and works uh, creating, you know, the landscape mountains, rivers, um, sea, uh, and all of those things that constitute our, our environment. And through that process, that Modi was further perpetuated. So the manner of the why is sourced in time from those, the creation period in the work of the Atua and the Whakapapa that intertwines us. When our ancestors, the mortal beings arrived, um, they became very integrally linked to the environment and dependent on it, of course. And so, and of that water was a, a central element among their values. The mato or the klutha was a medium for travel in the source of a range of mahikakai and the ecosystems and the migratory patterns that ebb and flow there. Um, the kinship connections were from mountain to the sea, invoked a uh, reciprocal relationship with our people. And that's based on um, kawa, which is customs, and the tikanga, which is the reasons for, and the sanctity of life and the life-giving power and sanctity. So there were rights and responsibilities, including the high duty to uphold and maintain the modi of water. If the modi of water is degraded, it has an impact not only on the mana of the why, uh, but also on the kinship relationship of mana whenua. So this is an enduring relationship from the past, connecting to the present, and of course, what we've got to guard for, for the future. So in terms of priorities, uh, ours very much up, align up with the uh, NPSFM, where the health and well-being of water bodies in freshwater ecosystems have first priority. We must look after those. 
to allow the second to occur, which is the health and well-being needs of people for the domestic needs uh, and or gathering mahika kai. And in turn, if we do all of those well, the ability for people and communities to provide for their social, economic and cultural well-being. In the process, we seek partnership. We want to retain that relationship I've just talked about. Uh, and we want to improve and continue our customer uses through which a lot of our knowledge um, is conveyed across each generation. So um, in the, it's very much based on the interconnectedness of land, water, and sea, from mountain tops to the to the to the ocean. Uh, we see it as a, as a as a whole being, and uh, want to ensure that when we manage these things, we understand that. And taking in mind climate change and cumulative effects. Thank you, David. Kia ora, Edward. Uh, so we'll now kick into the majority of the, 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 the body of the presentation. Um, again, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat box at the bottom uh, and I will stop every now and then uh, to um, answer any questions or encourage others to answer any questions. Uh, I'll now pass, if you could please make sure that you're, um, you're muted if you're not speaking. Thank you. And, um, and I'll now pass to Tom de Palsmaker. Thank you, David. Thank you, Edward, as well. Thank you for sharing that perspective with us all tonight. Um, my name is Tom DePalsmacher. I'm the team leader of Freshwater and Land. And so I'm part of the, the team, um, a team with people from across different departments within council that is working on the new land and water plan. And in this part of the presentation, what I really want to do is um, explain to you a few terms, uh, a few concepts, that hopefully will allow you um, to better understand the purpose of why we're actually talking to you tonight. And also probably put you in a better position to participate in this process. Um, I'm gonna take you back a little bit um, to um, the basics. And uh, I'm, I'm very mindful of the fact that we've got people here that might be familiar with some of the things that I'll be talking about. And I apologies, uh, apologize for that. But we're also very much on, on, on the start of a journey and we want to make sure that we can take everybody along uh, on that journey. And uh, that means people that are relatively new um, to the issues uh, that we'll be talking about tonight. So uh, I just want to bring it back to actually what is a, a regional plan or a land and water regional plan. Um, well, the regional plan, or actually the ORC has a number of regional plans. And they're very much focused on managing uh, the impacts of activities on the environment. That's a little bit different from district plans. District plans, um, they have a focus on managing the urban environment, the built environment. They'll tell you where you can build houses um, and what standards you have to comply with when you do that and where you can subdivide. Regional plans have a, a different focus. They really look after the health of our natural resources. And so we've got a few ORC has a few regional plans. Uh, an example is uh, the air plan, which looks after the quality of the air. We've got a coast plan that uh, looks after the health of the coast. We've got a waste plan as well, which uh, manages discharges of waste, landfills. Um, and so we don't uh, degrade the, the health of our soil, of our land. Um, and so that's what uh, regional plans do. Now we're working now on a new land and water regional plan. And the purpose of that plan is to manage activities such as the taking of water, the damming of water, discharges to water, um, and um, make sure that these activities don't deteriorate the health of fresh water or any ecosystems that are associated with it or any other values as well. In the plan, uh, we've got various provisions and sometimes we refer to them as objectives, other times we call them policy, sometimes we talk about rules. They're all a little bit different. Um, an objective is a statement in the plan that really says what the plan needs to achieve. So uh, it will be a written statement along the lines of um, making sure that we have good water quality in a certain location by that time. 
a policy sets out how we're going to achieve that. And a rule is a little bit more specific in a sense that it will tell you which activities you can do, uh, activities that are permitted, provided you meet certain conditions, uh, or activities that you can't do at all. And we call those prohibited activities. It also will set out which activities require a resource consent. So that's in, in, a, in a summary what a regional plan does and what it contains. I'll go on to the next slide. Our, um, the plan that we're working on, the new land and water regional plan, uh, it is scheduled to be notified in, uh, the, by the end of 2023. Now, some of you might say, um, why do we need a, a new plan? Because we, we already have one. That is true. We actually have a water plan, uh, but it is pretty old. It was notified in 1998. So it's nearly a quarter of a century old. And um, it's fair to say that it's out of date. Um, it's very much a product of its time. Uh, the plan achieved some good things. Um, it uh, tried to make sure that we didn't degrade the environment, um, but it is also very much built around the idea that um, we need to maximize the use of our resources. Uh, it also um, is very much tailored toward the protection of existing use rights as well. And we're currently in a climate where expectations both within the community and expectations at a government level have actually changed. So um, that means that, for example, making sure that you don't have any further degradation might not be enough anymore. And in many cases, it isn't. Uh, at this point in time, there is an expectation that where a water body is degraded, that we bring it back to a healthy state so that we actually restore some of the things that we've lost along the way as well. Um, it was also addressing the issues and the challenges at the time. And those challenges and issues have changed. Uh, at the moment, uh, climate change is very much a hot topic. It wasn't uh, that much of a hot topic 25 years ago. So the plan pays less attention to that issue. Uh, also, we have seen um, development, and I'm talking both urban development as well as agricultural or rural development. We've seen that at a scale and in places that we didn't anticipate would happen 25 years ago. So um, again, another reason why the plan is a little bit out of date uh, because of the changing expectations and the new challenges that we're seeing, not just in Otago, but uh, across New Zealand and across the world actually, um, we've, um, we've got a, a whole set of new legislation um, and, and one of the most important pieces for us is actually uh, the new national policy statement for freshwater management that was introduced in 2020. And so the plan is not consistent. It doesn't give effect to that new NPS, that new national policy statement. We also have new environmental standards around freshwater that say or state what you can and cannot do. Um, that is also a piece of legislation that came out from central government. And our plan, some of the rules in our plan are inconsistent with that. I mentioned before the national policy statement for freshwater management uh, and, and a concept uh, that is very central in the national policy statement, but actually kind of trickles through other pieces of legislation that have come out in, 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 in recent times from central government and that deal with freshwater management is the mana or to why. Um, it is a new fundamental concept uh, and Edward actually previously uh, explained it very well. It's a new concept um, that um, needs to be applied in decision-making at all levels. So not just uh, at central government level, but very much so also at a regional level. That means that our new plan needs to incorporate that concept. It's a responsibility for uh, ORC, but uh, I also want to stress that it's a, a shared responsibility. Uh, the NPS is very clear that it says that it binds authorities as well as all New Zealanders. So um, looking after the health of water 
uh, as a first priority is something that we all have to do. It's a duty upon all of us. Um, it is only after we've done that, that we can start addressing the health needs of people. And when we talk about the health needs of people, we think about things such as uh, drinking water or the use of water for um, hygiene purposes. And uh, once we've given um, effect to those two priorities or looked after those two priorities, it's only then that we can address other uses of water, um, social uses, economic uses, or cultural uh, well-being uses. So I talked a little bit about what the plan is and some of the fundamental concepts that are going to go into the plan, the most prominent one, Tamana to Y. Um, now I want to talk a little bit about how we're going to do this. Um, we want to do this in a, in a collaborative manner. So that means that we're partnering up with IWI. Um, Sandra, who's here, Maria, uh, and, and other people, um, IWI representatives, will be developing the plan very much with us. Uh, we're also going to build on past consultation. Um, we've heard uh, in the past as well, um, we've been talking to communities uh, on various occasions. Um, we don't want to redo the work. We want to build on it. So whatever we heard in the past, we're bringing that forward. The same applies to uh, information that we've got, technical information. Uh, we're going to build on, on the information that we have. But in some cases, there are some information uh, information gaps and so we need to fill them with new investigations uh, and that will be technical information around hydrology ecology economics but also um, information around ev value so we want to bring all of that together and then we also want to do through engagement uh, with communities the likes of yourself and fano and at this stage it is very much to understand your values and what you want the environment to look like in the future. I talked a little bit about, you know, how we want to work together with different um, communities and, and groups, um, but you may wonder um, what does the process actually look like? What are the different steps that um, the we have to take the communities through and where does it start? Um, it actually started about three years ago. Uh, three years ago, Council um, developed freshwater management units. David mentioned that at the start, um, we split up the region into different freshwater management units or FMUs. And in some cases where we uh, had a very big FMU, we applied uh, sub FMUs, which we called Rohe. So uh, we did that three years ago. After we did that, we consulted with the communities on freshwater visions uh, and that took place in 2020. And that was under the banner of the development of the RPS. So at that point, we talked about to communities about what they wanted to see in the freshwater vision. And we also mm -hmm. talked about the boundaries of those freshwater management units. Now, the freshwater vision and, um, or the proposed freshwater vision that we've got for um, the Roxborough Rohe, I'll bring it up later on, but it is very much a high level document. Um, it is a summary of, um, or a summary statement of where we want the Rohe to be um, in 2045. I say it's very much high level and I refer to it as a summary because uh, it talks about values in very broad categories. And it's also incomplete because it, it doesn't cover all the values that may apply to this Rohe. So today we're here to um, actually um, refine that picture, fill in the gaps and inquire about any additional values um, that may apply to this Rohe. Um, just to give you a little bit of an understanding of what we mean uh, when we use the word value, it is simply something that is important to you or something that matters. And um, I thought I'd take you through this by using an example. So a value that we often refer to as water quality. Now, the issue with water quality is different. People might have a different understanding about what makes a good water quality. For some people, it is the fact that there's very little algae. For other people, it means that the risk 
of getting sick is very low. For other people, it has to do about the clarity of the water or about the fact that you have clean river bottoms, or it could be a combination of all these things and other things. So the characteristic is an aspect of that value that kind of makes that experience. So I put forward here the, the example of clarity as being a characteristic of water quality. So once we know what your value is and the characteristic and how you think the characteristic should be in the future, we can start defining an outcome. And an outcome is very much a narrative statement. And I've put one up uh, in the example at the bottom of the slide. So an outcome could be something along the lines of river and streams have clear flowing water from headwear waters to mouth. So that addresses the characteristic clarity. I say it's a, a narrative statement, so it's easy to understand, but at the same time, and that is a bit of an issue that has occurred with older plans, um, it is a little bit ambiguous as well, because you know what is the cutoff point uh, where you determine that water is no longer clear? It's an issue that a lot of older plans have. So going forward in the new plan, what we wanna do is find an attribute for the characteristic clarity and for the value water quality. And an attribute is basically an indicator. So in this case, we could use uh, suspended fine sediment as an indicator for clarity. Um, and then once we've done that, we will come up with rules um, that make sure that we've got good clarity and consequently good water quality, provided we do a whole lot of other things as well. Um, but that's a little bit of the process that we have to go through to go from the values or actually go from the vision and then the values to the development of rules and limits. Are there any questions at this point or any yeah, points that Tom, we can clarify? Tom, David just asked a question. You talked about the, um, the raw hair values, uh, oh, sorry, um, delivery uh, boundaries. Can yep. you answer why, how were the boundaries determined? How do we get to those lines of the map? And why is Alex divided from the money here? Yeah, um, it's, a, it's a really hard exercise. Um, there is no silver bullet to, or, or, or there's no golden rule of thumb that you can apply in all cases. Um, but in, in this case, um, we developed it together with Iwi and then we consulted it on. Um, the Manaharakia is separate um, from the uh, Roxburgh Rohe. And for the Manaharakia Rohe, we basically used the boundaries of the Manaharakia catchments. So that's why, you know, the boundary between the Manaharakia Rohe and Roxburgh Rohe is um, where it is now. It is basically the, the watershed area. Um, the Manaharakia is a, a sizable catchment, and we thought it would be good um, to, to keep it as one catchment. With the Roxburgh Rohe, we grouped together smaller catchments um, just to make it manageable. Catchments that are part of the same community and that have um, largely similar issues or similar characteristics, um, one of them being the fact that it's a dry climate. And, and, and yeah, um, warm summers as well. Also the type of economic activity that happens within that area. Thanks, Tom. Um, and uh, Paulette has asked a question. Edward, I think you were keen to answer that question. Hello, uh, David. I wasn't sure I was keen to. It's interesting <laughs> to hear, hear um, Tom's uh, answer to that, but I think in the uh, slides, uh, Tom, in the terms of the priorities uh, under Te Mano Te Wai, you had cultural um, uh, well-being and use under category three, uh, priority three. And Paulette's asking why it wasn't across all three, from one, two, and three. Um, and if I give my version of it, the, the correct um, interpretation would be because of that explanation I gave earlier on, we, we're connected by whakapapa, mm -hmm. in fact, by descent. Um, and it's an artificial thing to separate us from one, two, or three. 
you can't do it, culturally speaking, that's all. Um, and it, it needs to be across all three. It's a, it's a Eurocentric approach to try and separate us from, from any of them. Yeah, yeah, I, I very much want to acknowledge that. Um, I, I took the words from um, the NPS, uh, basically, which is probably um, based on a, on a Eurocentric thinking. Yes, and I think you um, throw you under the bus again, Tom, but I think you referred to it as a new concept, and I think it, it is important to recognise it is a, a fundamental principle, principle or way of yeah. thinking. It's also yeah. been in the MPS for a wee while, but what we're talking about is that hierarchy. Yeah. Uh, just expanding on Dave's question, uh, so the Roxbury Air at Rohe was consulted upon. Um, who was consulted? When were they consulted? And how was that consultation undertaken? I um, I was not part of that consultation, um, but it was part of, um, I believe it was in 2020, um, it was part of the, the visions um, and we um, collated feedback on the boundaries at that time. Um, and those boundaries together with the vision went into the proposed RPS, which was notified last year. But my understanding was that we had a, Kind of a roadshow um, with in-person meetings across the region. We did, Tom. And uh, just to uh, expand upon that question, if I don't like where the lines are drawn, what can I do about it now? Unfortunately, um, it's a different process. So the, the, the mapping and the vision are in the proposed RPS, uh, which is a different document. Uh, it has been notified already, it was notified last year, uh, and the submissions have closed as well. So um, in this case, I believe that, yeah, it's very unlikely that the boundaries will change. Can I, can I also say something? Listen, 99.9% .9 of people in Roxborough won't have even known that there was a process as low that they can contribute to it. At the end of the day, political decisions will be made around the council table. If you are unhappy with the process, and many will be, um, there are representatives who you elect and pay um, who are your servants. So do get in contact with them. Thank you, Councillor Laws. Um, Tom, going back to that point, um, what is the document that we're referring to? And just uh, can you, would you mind just expanding upon it in terms of the planning hierarchy without getting too detailed? You mean the RPS, the Regional RPS. Policy Statement? Yes, yes, yeah. where that sits amongst the, the hierarchy. So um, I mentioned before um, district plan and regional plans. Regional plans almost, um, and district plans sit at the bottom of the planning hierarchy. Um, above the district plan and the regional plans sits a document called regional policy statement. It is a, a, a policy document that is written by ORC, but it um, ensures that there is a, a strong degree, it sets high level outcomes for the region, and it ensures that those outcomes are um, consistent between both um, district plans and regional plans. So it makes sure that there is a, that all the district plans also work towards the same outcome. So it, it kind of makes sure, like I said before, that all the plans at low level work together. Thanks, Tom. And just in terms of uh, Councillor Laws' question or, or, or point, why do we go through a regional policy statement process so quick, why aren't we still having those more detailed discussions with uh, communities around the proposed regional policy statement? <laughs> now, I guess I'm leading question around timeframes. Yeah, I mean, uh, with both um, the development of the land and water plan and the regional policy statement, um, the development was done in accordance with the timeframe that was agreed with the minister. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. yeah. We, we had it imposed from on high. So in essence, um, the ORC didn't have an awful lot of choices. Um, 
So many of the issues uh, have been imposed from central government, including this whole process really, um, with their values. Um, to be honest with you, they haven't thought through the details. Of course they haven't. They don't know how it works in Roxburgh. We're really, really reliant upon you to tell us where the rubber hits the road. So it's the detail of these issues that's important, critically important. We can talk big picture all night if we like. It's you determining how that actually works on the ground that gives us an honest representation of what our policy will be. And that's what we're looking for going into the future. Thank you, Councillor Laws, and certainly take on board that point around um, communities driving their own uh, um, their own outcomes. Um, and we will discuss shortly um, the, the process we're going to go for, from here uh, and why we are going through this, this initial step. Um, Tom, would you mind moving on to the, the next slide? Yep, thank you. So I mentioned before the vision. This is not the full vision, it's a summary but I thought it would be useful to bring it up because it is an important input into the objectives or the uh, outcomes that we set in our land and water plan. Uh, the community consultation that we're undertaking now is very important in terms of setting that direction. But whatever we do, it needs to be consistent with the vision. Um, and it needs to be, uh, there are other inputs as well, Another input is um, the NPS, the NPS FM sets um, has certain policies and certain bottom lines. So we need to bring this into the process as well. And then another input is also um, the feedback that we get from our Runaka as well, which is an important input. But I thought I'd bring up the vision uh, for the uh, proposed Roxborough Rohe. Um, and I'll take you through it. Um, the first bullet point, it refers to the fact that it's a single connected system with a pure water source. And that actually refers to the fact, that actually refers to the water Klutha Mata Ao um, catchment of which this Rohe is part. It also reminds us of the fact that the waters that come into this Rohe are actually um, pretty pure at the headwaters of the Klutha and, and, and the source lakes. Um, a second point is the important relationship of Kaitahu with uh, Wahi Tupuna, and we need to make sure that that is sustained. Um, natural form and function are important as well. Um, easy migration of indigenous species and Clutha hydroelectricity generation, which is a matter of national significance. Those five bullet points are actually um, consistent across all Rohe. Um, within the Kluthamata OFMU. So they also apply to uh, the Manaharakia, uh, the Dunstan Rohe, the Lower Klutha Rohe, and the Upper Lakes one. Um, the bottom two ones are specific to this Rohe. Um, I'll, uh, the first one talks about sustainable takes from bigger rivers or groundwater in preference to smaller streams. And that actually recognizes that um, if there is um, a, a bigger water source available that allows for sustainable water taking, we should actually focus on that um, rather than on taking from smaller streams, which often have higher values, because that's where a lot of the um, threatened aquatic species are. Um, and then the final bullet point is um, a sustainable land and water management uh, practices supporting food production um, also look, making sure that we um, reduce our contaminant discharges and providing for safe human contact. And these, all these bullet points, um, the aspiration is to achieve those by 2045, which is again, the same time frame that applies to um, the, the Manaharakia Rohe. So that's the vision. And like I said, it's, it's pretty high level. It covers a lot of values but not all of them. And um, I'll move on to now that, to the values because I want to talk a little bit about the values. Um, there are certain values that apply to every FMU and every Rohe. And that is a requirement under the uh, NPSFM. 
and we refer to them, or actually the NPSFM refers to them as compulsory values. The first one is ecosystem health, and it's got five components, which I'll list on the slide in the first um, column. The second one is human contact, so that refers to swimming. Threatened species is the third one, and Mahika Kai is the fourth one. So those ones, those values, we need to uh, provide for in all cases. Um, then the NPSFM also requires us to ask you about other values, and I label them as values that must be considered. So I have to, we have to ask you today or in the coming weeks, whether you think natural character is important, whether fishing is important, and whether various uses of water are important. And again, I listed them there. And then in the third column, um, I refer to other values identified. So the NPS FM asks us to engage with you to make sure that any values that are not listed in national legislation, uh, that they are also identified. So you can go beyond what is in uh, national legislation. Now, um, we've got a survey uh, online uh, that asks about values, but some of the terms that are listed here and that are adopted from the NTSFM are quite technical. Um, so what we've tried to do in the survey is use some plain English. So for example, where um, the NPSFM refers to the compulsory value of aquatic life, we might have a statement describing that as plants or animals that live in or near water. So it is actually clear to everybody what we mean with that. So I talked a little bit about the vision. I talked a little bit about the values. I also um, talked about um, you know how how values might have different characteristics, um, and perhaps people have a certain idea of the outcome they want for a value. So um, I would invite people here on the Zoom. Uh, is there anyone who? wants to talk about a value that is important for them or for their community or FANO. Um, it could be an environmental value, but people are also welcome to talk about other values, economic values or social values, recreational values. Tom, just before we jump into that, I think there are a couple of questions here who, okay. that might shape some of those, that value discussion. So Dave has asked, so how does it work if you get water from a different rohe? That then the rub, the rohe you live in, for example, if you're taking irrigation water uh, and using it in another rohe. Yeah, um, did this um, some we were very much aware of this uh, situation, and um, it's it, it happens uh, around this rohe. Uh, my understanding is that some of the water comes from the Manaharakia rohe. Um, it is something that we're aware of and that we're going to address, address in the land and water plan. Um, the first preference would be to use local water. Um, but it is, yeah, it's one of the issues that we've got to work through. And we've got a number of other um, consultation stages where we can discuss responses to those issues. Um, there is also a cultural component to it as well. Um, I was wondering maybe, Edward, uh, are you happy to respond to that as well? Uh, sorry, what was that, uh, Tom? Um, about the, the transfer of water. Oh, sorry. From yeah. yeah, well, uh, it's that interconnectedness and each uh, waterway having its own distinctive whakapapa. So it's generally not a thing that we uh, condone or um, align with mixing, what we call mixing of waters, conveying characteristics of one catchment to another. So yeah, generally it's sort of uh, counter, counter to our views and values. Thank you, Rob. Thank you. Can I ask a question? Yes. Um, Edward, so 
there are two huge dams sitting on the Clutha River. One of them's at, Clu at Clyde and the other one's at Roxburgh since I think 1965-66. Um, I'm pretty sure they're not culturally appropriate, are they? No, they're not, and nor were we consulted. Um, talking to Minister Woods about that today, actually. Um, no, that was in an era when our people didn't have a say outside their Murray boundaries. Um, and uh, we started to have more of a say around the time of the aluminium smelter proposal at Aramoana, but it's been a long road to get to the okay. point we're at now. No. But they're there now. Are they culturally offensive and in the way, or do you just have to accept them as a fact of life? Don't think there's been enough research done, Michael, to um, allow uh, elvers to get up stream of the dams and for the adults to migrate and that type of thing. There is mitigation that could be done to improve the, the difficulties they impose. So yeah, they are there now. And uh, I just believe not enough has been done to mitigate those impacts. Thank you, Edward. Uh, and that does go to a point, Tom, when you looked at the, um, you discussed the, uh, the raw hair long-term vision, uh, there was mention of the Clutha Hydroelectricity Generation Scheme and a reference to national significance. Do you just want to touch on that? Yeah, um, the Clutha uh, Hydroelectricity Scheme has been given also prominence in, in the NPS FM. It is recognised as something important. Uh, as part of New Zealand response to climate change. So basically what the NPSFM um, tells us is that we've got to, um, yeah, um, be, be very careful um, as to how we deal with it and, and, and recognize the importance of hydroelectricity uh, generation. That isn't to say that the way the dam is working at the moment and the impacts um, that it has, that some of the impacts shouldn't be addressed. Sorry, Tom, I was under the impression that they were excluded from the national policy statement on freshwater management. Um, Explicitly they, by legislation. They are excluded in so far it concerns water quality. So um, the national environmental or some national environmental bottom lines don't necessarily apply to them. That, that was my answer. Thank you. Water quality, yep. Yeah. Thanks, Tom. Uh, and Sandra, I think you just wanted to add to that discussion. Tom, um, Tom has, I think, set out the situation reasonably well. I just wanted to sort of I guess, make the link between um, those things that Councillor Law and that Tom and that Edward have been saying. I think um, the dams on the Clutha do have a particular um, status under the NPS. And as Tom said, that means that they are exempted from meeting some of the bottom lines. It doesn't exempt them from the requirement to consider how um, to Mana or to why should be given effect to though. So what that means, I think, is that we have um, a challenge, um, potentially quite a significant challenge, but it's something that we need to be thinking about in terms of developing this plan is in terms of the sorts of disruptions that the dams have created. Um, and Edward talked about the disruption for um, eel migration as one of those things. In terms of those sorts of disruptions, I think part of what we need to be looking at in terms of development of this plan is are there ways in which we can manage things so as to reduce some of the effects of those disruptions and look at bringing back some of the natural um, behaviour of the river despite the fact that those dams are there. Thanks, Sandra. Jane has been very patient with me, but it goes to, um, again, uh, drawing water. Tom, uh, does that mean if you, uh, the discussion we've had, uh, does that mean if you were part of the Roxborough of Rohe, uh, you would not be able to access water from the Manahia Kea? And I guess uh, if I can um, add to that, Jane, I'm, I guess that's a conversation around both the lines 
and also the drawing of water between different water bodies? It's, a, um, it's really hard to comment on a specific situation. Um, I mean, in, in the case of the Mano Harakia, uh, Rohe, that water body is closed off for any further extraction. So if it would be a new take, um, it's, it's fully allocated at the moment. Um, we wouldn't be able to grant a consent anyway. Um, in terms of existing takes, like I said before, um, it's an, an issue. There are existing practices. Um, we want, as a principle, we want to discourage that. Um, but, you know, it's an issue we're aware of and um, we'll, we'll try to deal with it in an appropriate way. And it, it is something that we um, are happy to discuss in, in, you know, next consultation. Thanks, Tom. Uh, Pat, you've asked about Lake Onslow. Uh, we can have discussion offline about that, but that is a, effectively a, uh, a, a parallel or higher level discussion. Um, and there are um, obviously um, similar requirements to meet in terms of delivering on to Manotu Wai, um, but that is a, a nationally driven program um, that we're probably sitting outside or above this process, but we can, we can discuss that later on if you uh, want to stay online. Uh, Tom, um, Dave has... Dave has a question for you. I think I've uh, poorly worded his questions prior. So Dave, if you wouldn't mind uh, vocalizing your question, just check yourself off mute. Dave, you're off mute, but we can't hear you. I'll, um, I'll have a look on the chat. Okay. Let's make sure that it hasn't uh, come to me directly. Uh, yeah, so what Dave is asking is um, they have not figured out what to do about water takes across, across Rohe. I guess that, that goes to uh, both the discussion around where it is preferable for in-stream values uh, to draw yeah. water from, and also the cultural impact. Yeah, I think, I mean, like I said before, uh, at this point in time, uh, we're very much interested in setting outcomes. Um, how we're gonna achieve them is, is a whole, um, to object, uh, sorry, to policies and rules. And I think how we're gonna deal with those uh, transfers of water across Rohe boundaries uh, sits at that level. So I see it very much as something that we've got to work through in the next couple of months and come back to you on um, in, in, yeah, when, when we're coming back, which is scheduled to be uh, early in the second half of this year. So around July, August. It is a discussion as well that needs to be had with our EV partners and, and with other in, interest groups. To understand what kind of environmental values we're yeah. trying to deliver on and then what that means yeah. for those specific questions. Thanks, Tom. Uh, Tom, I have uh, scuppered your values discussion. Um, no. Around, um, that we were trying to promote a bit of a discussion around what is uh, important to community members in, these, in this uh, rohe. Um, what do you value? What are the characteristics of those values? Uh, for example, is there somewhere you like going fishing? Is there somewhere where you gather kai? Um, what are those values? And just a bit of a discussion around uh, what that looks like for you. So if anyone wants to chip in, we'd be uh, really keen to hear from you. I guess that's uh, deafening silence means uh, <laughs> means no. Hey Tom, would you mind going on to the the next slide? Because so I think this is yep. a big chunk of the um, some of the concern around here. Yeah. So um, this gives you a little bit of an overview of um, the different steps um, and the, the the stages when we're going to consult with you. I showed you a previous slide. Uh, with uh, different columns and um, arrows. That was a combination of um, processes, some of which were done internally. 
but there are actually four steps or four important phases for community consultation. And uh, the first one is confirming the values and, and discussing their characteristics, which we're doing now. The second one is presenting and discussing the outcomes based on what you've told us now and over the next couple of weeks through the online tools and the different management options to achieve those outcomes. And that's going back to earlier questions around how you're gonna deal with transfers of water. Um, that's where the conversation around that topic will happen at that stage. Once we get input on that, we'll choose a preferred management option and that goes into the plan. Um, in terms of the timing, uh, stage two, like I said before, um, July, August this year, uh, preferred management option would be towards the end of this year. That's when we present that to the community. And then uh, the proposed land and water regional plan out for submissions, so notification, is at the end of 2023. There's a big gap between step three and step four, but that is because uh, we have to go through a number of uh, procedural hoops um, before we can notify. Um, and uh, yeah, so a lot of the consultation, actually all of it, is intended to be done over the span of this year. So Tom, just picking up on the sort of subcurrent going there, um, we're sick of you bloody bureaucrats talking at us. Um, when is the rubber going to hit the road? When are we going to have those meaty discussions? And what's that going to look like? Stage two. Thank you. Yeah. And I guess that's, uh, that's where OIC really puts its neck on the line, uh, giving all the feedback we're receiving, what we have to do through the, uh, the national requirements um, and puts a range of options on the table to now that discussion around values and trade-offs, et cetera. So would you mind going on to the next slide? So a bit of a discussion around how you can have your say. Um, so the primary avenue, I really want to reinforce this um, because of, we have concerns that um, people might um, walk away from this thinking they shouldn't or, 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 or can't provide feedback. Primary avenue is by completing the online survey. So that follows a format that meets the requirements uh, as Tom has talked about. So we really need that structured format to take it through to the next discussion at, um, at consultation phase two. Um, so really encourage you uh, both to complete the survey and also uh, encourage your friends and whanau to complete the survey. Um, you can also mark areas of significance on the online waterways map. Uh, and this, I, I think there is either a link on the page you joined with or a, a link through the information we've sent you um, to that online waterways map, um, as well as the, um, the FM Rohe we're talking about. Um, and also um, really important, if you are doing the survey and you do want to hear from us that you provide, uh, you provide um, um, your email address or contact details if you do want to hear from us. So Tom, would you mind moving to the next slide? I think we are um, towards the end. Just um, two points that maybe I could add is one, if you're in an area that does not have um, good online or doesn't have, uh, or if you don't have access to internet at all, um, we're more than happy to um, send you uh, upon request a hard copy of the survey. Um, the other thing is when you're doing the survey, um, you, the survey is anonymous. Uh, when you're doing the interactive map, you will be asked for your email address, but that will not display on the map um, that is visible to everybody um, accessing uh, the website. So it's anonymous in that sense. No email addresses will be displayed. Also, when we report back um, on the survey results, um, that will be anonymous as well, just to put everyone at ease at that level. Um. Thanks, Tom. Uh, just a couple of uh, questions coming through, and we are in that Q&A stage. 
Uh, Georgia Grant, what lessons have been learned from Plan Change 7 and what things will be put in place to avoid issues around water permits, in particular for businesses and, and I guess communities, Georgia, um, reliant on water? What well, lessons? Um, quite a few. I, I think um, I've, I've went through the process. Um, it gave me a little bit of an insight as to where decision makers want us to see, uh, want us to go in terms of a, um, our future plan, what they expect to see in terms of rules. One example is, um, for example, the way the current plan is structured is it, it, it looks at chapters as distinct chapters. So um, when you apply for a water take, um, you go through a consent process and you'll be evaluated around the impacts of the water abstraction on your water body. Decision makers have made a clear signal that going forward um, that we need to be more integrated. And what that means is they expect us um, to look at the effects of the end use as well. So if you apply for water take, um, in the future, the effects in terms of nutrient discharges or nutrient leaching of the end use will be a consideration, or that's at least what decision makers like to see. Um, I think a lot of um, debate was also around consent timeframes. Uh, and I've had a lot of questions about that in the wake of the uh, Plan Change 7 process as well. You know, going forward, will we have um, six year timeframes for perpetuity? Or are we going back to 35 year timeframes? Um, again, um, going forward, I think what we'll see is that timeframes will be decided based on the level of risk. There won't be a, like a, a set timeframe like 35 years for all consents. In fact, 35 years con consent durations are across New Zealand, <clears throat> sorry, across New Zealand, the thing of the past. Um, if you look around you, you'll see more 20, 15 year timeframes is more appropriate. So those are some of the lessons. And I think takeaway messages that we can take from that process. Thanks, Tom. Uh, Jane's just got a question here. Um, she struggles taking part in an online survey. It does not seem like a good way of grappling with the tensions and issues, e.g. working through climate change and addressing economic changes. Jane, uh, just in terms of that, um, if you flick me a message around any issues you're having around the online survey, um, or what I'm what I'm taking from the question is, why even bother? Um, particularly when we're dealing with all of these issues, all of these constant moving pieces, um, and and trying to figure out actually what it means for us. Yeah. Um, look, we struggle with the same problem in a way, um, but in, in the current climate, it is just too much risk to go to a public meeting. Um, some people are not comfortable meeting up in public and um, we've got to respect that. Uh, also from a staff perspective as well, um, we've got a, a team that is working through the consultation. Um, it is by no means um, a, a long stretch to think that some of us will become a close contact or a few of us will become a close contact. So the this allows us, gives us better guarantees that we don't have to cancel last minute. And um, we, we, we are, um, if the circumstances allow for it, um, we will come back in person for the next consultation stages. Thanks, Tom. And I think that is important. Um, we take the feedback now, we come back to the communities, you have a, the opportunity for a, a say both now and at that point, and as Tom said, at that uh, third step as well, when we come to the communities again, uh, face to face, have a discussion around what we think is the preferred option, considering the feedback we've had and the process we go through. Um, and then again, uh, we get to the end, we put out a draft plan and there's the opportunity for feedback um, once that draft plan is out as well. Uh, and as Councillor Laws has said, uh, there's also that political avenue as well. Please talk to your, um, the people you've, you've elected. Uh, Question here, um, the 
Roxburgh Dam, values and safety. 50 years past its use by date. So I guess it's in terms of um, what happens once the consent comes up, how is the, the Roxburgh Dam and any, any replacement or any repairs to it, how is that going to be treated under the land water? Uh, at this stage, if I'm honest, uh, this, uh, um, the consent does not expire until 2042, if I've got it right. So uh, that's another two decades. Um, the dam operators themselves are um, bound to um, certain requirements under law to maintain the safety of the dam as well. Thanks, Tom. Uh, so this is a question here from Caroline as well. Exactly who are the decision makers? On, on, on the I guess, the, I, go, I guess that goes to both uh, when our decisions made uh, and then we get to the end of the process. What role do our politicians play in influencing the decision? Um, and then we get to the end of the process, we go through the planning process, who gets to make decisions on A, the plan and B, what we've heard mm. through the planning process. Yeah, it kind of changes. Um, in the development of the plan, there's a, a various inputs. So um, the community is an input. Uh, the, the previous RPS visioning process is an input as well. Like I said before, natural, national legislation set bottom lines, that is an input. And IWI is a very important input as well. That's how the plan gets developed. We as planners, our role is mainly to kind of look after a process and, and a big deal of that process is to bring those things together. Then after we develop it, um, we take it out to consultation. That's prior to notification uh, with a number of statutory parties um, and IWI. So when I refer to the statutory parties, uh, that means uh, MFE, district councils, a number of government agencies. Um, the plan, if they have some concerns with the plan, the plan gets updated. But then at that point, that is right before the notification, it goes to council. Um, if council adopts the plan, it gets notified. Um, there is a submission period following on from that where people, everybody can make a submission. And after that, it goes through a freshwater planning, uh, it goes through a freshwater, uh, a panel of freshwater commissioners. And that is a new step, a new, uh, it's different from previous processes where after the plan was notified, it went through a council hearing and only then it went, if it was appealed, if that decision from council was appealed, it went to the environment court. Now we've got a little bit of a shortcut, uh, which means that instead of going to a council hearing, it goes to a, a freshwater commissioner panel that acts a little bit like an environment court panel. Um, they are professional judges and, and commissioners and um, it also means that the appeal rights afterwards are, are pretty limited. Um, so it's a shortcut, um, which has pros and cons probably. Um, it is a little bit more daunting to appear before a, um, a commissioner panel, uh, but at the same time, a shorter process hopefully also means less cost on both sides or less time. Thanks, Tom. Uh, would you mind moving on to the next slide there, Tom? Yep. Uh, iPhone, whoever that is, we might, uh, it's more detailed discussion. We, we might stick around, if you won't mind sticking around, we might have discussion after that. It's, uh, we're talking dame safety, which goes outside the scope of the, the land and water regional plan. So certainly take on board your comments. Uh, this is a little out of the discussion. And, and also, uh, I think it's one of those issues that we sort of, um, we want to uh, 
might might um, be worth chatting. Yeah. yeah, safety is our priority. Now, look, we'll, we'll have a bit of a chat with that with you after that. Yeah, happy to do that. So, how do you, um, in terms of the online survey, next steps? Uh, the online survey for the Roxborough Rohe closes 28 March. There are other surveys for other Rohe and freshwater management units. The closing date for those surveys close at different times. So, really encourage you if you are going to provide feedback in other FMU Rohe. Uh, please, please check the closing dates on that. If you need a paper copy, as as Thomas said, if you have poor internet connectivity, uh, if you have, if you just prefer to fill out a paper copy, please get in touch with our um, customer services team, uh, and there is uh, there are those contact details on the web page. Um, information on the Roxburgh Rohe and the Land and Water Regional Plan process more broadly will be constantly updated including uh, some socioeconomic assessments uh, for the Rohe, which are still being developed. I think will resonate with, um, with some of you. Uh, and when we have information, we will put that uh, information up on the, the page, uh, the, the Roxborough Rohe page. And again, if you are filling out the survey and you are interested uh, in staying in touch around what is happening, please provide your contact details when you fill that survey out. I should also say in terms of the survey, it's not just the process and the information um, that Tom has outlined. We do ha also have a discussion box allowing for any feedback you may want to provide. That might be your own perspectives, that might be information you're aware of that you want us to look at when we're going through to this next step. So please feel free to use that uh, online survey for us, uh, whatever you want. Again, Tom said, uh, we will be having that meaty discussion with you in the second half of 2022 to um, talk about the potential management options. And again, through consultation three, to talk about the preferred management option. And that'll really be where the rubber hits the road. And again, uh, we are going to front up and have that discussion. So in terms of the process, we've still got a, a wee bit of time. Uh, staff are gonna stay online for a bit longer. So if you want to talk further with uh, a staff member, please stay online um, straight afterwards after this, this meeting closes. And again, really appreciate you taking the time and effort. I understand that for many of you, this is uh, just a further unnecessary step. Um, we do appreciate you providing feedback. We do appreciate you um, providing the survey to other people to provide their feedback. Um, and as Tom said, it's not a, a step we've just put in place because we need something to do. It is a step we need to follow. And it is also something that you really need to, um, to get involved in, in in order to influence, uh, influence the process. Uh, Edward, would you mind closing with the karakia? Kia ora, David, oops. Thank you. Um, yes, as I opened, I'll close with karakia and uh, trust everyone has a safe and uh, enjoyable rest of the night. Nō reira, ke tau, ke tātou katoa, te atawhai, o tō tātou āriki, a hukraiti me te aroha, o te atua me te whiwhinga tahitanga, ki te wairo tapu, āke āke, āmene. Pō māri e. Have a good evening. Kia ora, thank you, Edward. Um, so if, please, if you want to have a detailed discussion or, or make further points, please uh, feel free to stick around. Just uh, give it a couple of minutes, just in case anyone else wants to jump off. But um, Mike, I saw your thumb up. Does that mean you wanted to ask a question? No, I was just giving Edward Allison a thumb up. Thanks for his um, uh, participation and um, finishing off in, in the way that he did. Appreciate that, Mike. Thank you. No, no problem. Thank you. So do we need, have any more uh, questions? And please, please, um, we're no longer taking up other people's time. So please be as broad ranging as you'd like. Again, if we can't answer it, we'll, um, we'll find someone who can answer it. Um, I might just be able to, because there's been a couple of questions about dam safety. 
Mm. Yeah, I think David and just it might just be worth clarifying for people that there is a there is a totally separate process that works through the Building Act in terms of dam safety, and that is still a responsibility of regional councils. Um, but it's a it's a separate thing, and I um, I understand that um, RIC might have actually been been using the I guess the the greater experience with dams of um, ECAN in terms of dealing with those processes as well. But um, someone at ORC might be able to correct me on that if I'm wrong. Thanks, Sandra. No, you're right, Sandra. Yeah. Um, it's outsourced. Um, I, we deal to some degree, um, we deal with the safety effects from, or the yeah, safety impacts um, from the discharges. We can deal with that, you know, in, in terms of ramping rates, but actually the structural integrity of dams is a uh, yeah, different process. Thank you for that. I um the the person who was answering that uh, asking that question has jumped off, uh, but I hope they um they uh, watch this video when it goes up online. Actually, um just while we while we're taking questions at the end here, I'm actually represent the Tivi Irrigation Company, I guess. Just in terms of the um the Tivi River, which connects with the Clutha, in terms of what we're talking about here and the consents that are held over that river um, it comes out of Lake Onslow obviously there's uh, the irrigation company in conjunction with uh, Pioneer Generation hold consents over that river just as it flows into the Clutha. Um, just the crossover with what we're doing here with um, how it all applies or how it all ties in with um, what you're trying to achieve here. Can anyone comment on that? Could, could you elaborate a little bit what you mean with a, a crossover? So, well, um, the Teviot River obviously feeds into the Clutha. Yeah. It's part of the Rohe. Um, yeah. You know, and the values that are involved with that. Um, I mean, we have consents for hydro generation and irrigation take, which expire in 2041. Um, and you're, you're developing, obviously, this uh, plan around the Rohe and just where it fits within the um, frame of what you're doing? Um, so the new plan, even though your consents expire, um, probably um, after the next revision of the plan will be notified, um, the plan can set limits that have an impact on that. And it, it could affect the working of the dam. Um, through a review of consent conditions. I mean, it's important to be open about that. Um, we think, are, yeah. the, the, Teviot, the Teviot River is actually below the dam. It flows into the um, cliffs yeah. are below the dam. So it, it's, the dam or the at Roxburgh is no consequences at all for what we do. But the Teviot River connects to the Clutha, I guess, yeah. after, after we've taken water for irrigation and hydro. Yeah. So just, I'm um, just, you know, in terms of what you're trying to achieve here, how that would fit in the bigger picture of things in terms of the Rock Rohi. Just, well, I just, mean, just to get an idea of what we're looking at in terms of, yeah. you know, um, consulting and, you know, yeah. can I, values can I, and that sort of thing. Yep. Can I say something, Tom? Or are you? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, get into it. <laughs> the way the way um, we're looking at it, the way because Tamana Uta, the Tamana Otawai concept in the national policy statement um, means that you have to give first consideration to what is needed for the health and well-being of the water body in anything you do. So that includes um, not just the main stem of the Clutha Mata'o, but also the rivers like the Teviot that run into it, and also all the small tributaries. Um, that there mm -hmm. are as well. So it means that in terms of each of those, that question of um, how are we supporting the health and well-being of that water body has to be front and centre in terms of um, the direction that is taken 
in the regional plan. So in terms of something, the other thing that the regional plan has to do um, is to provide a pathway towards um, meeting the long-term visions that are set out in the regional policy statement. So as Tom said, although your um, consents might have a longer term than perhaps this version of the um, land and water plan will, then you, we would certainly still expect to see within the regional plan some um, direction that shows what the likely actions are that are going to be needed to achieve the long-term vision as part of that. So um, that will still influence um, and will give you, I guess, a signal as to what you need to be doing um, when you renew your consents later on if if the council doesn't review them earlier. Yeah, so all of those values, essentially they... Um take consideration of when we renew consents anyway. From time to time, we have to renew, you know, partial consents or whatever. So all those values are tied into the consents already anyway. Yeah. But I think... Um, right, th thanks for that. Yep. I... Did you have anything to add, Tom? Because you... we've got a question from Georgia, and I guess it does revisit that, um, that Plan Change 7 question. Um, just in regards to plan change seven, there was a lot of extra stress and phenomenal costs around the mistakes made. It has made it nearly impossible to make ends meet for uh, businesses, families, farms, and communities. This has only all been done for only six years, so we need reassurance that this will not occur again. And the blocks put in place are not there. Sound reasoning and common sense needs to prevail over issues that are on paper that aren't actually present in real life. So plan change seven, what do we learn from that? How are we going to reflect the practicalities of those who need to use water to produce food? Yes, David, I'm just reading the, uh, the chat now. Okay. Um, and because um, there's a lot in there. Um, if you scroll to the bottom, you'll see uh, yeah. George's recent question. Yeah. Yeah, look, um, again, uh, I can acknowledge all of that. Um, it, it puts um, it, it puts a hold on things for six years, and and there is the uncertainty of what's going to happen, you know, in new land and water plan going forward. Um, plan change um, seven, I think, is a clear signal that things have to change. Um, you know, it won't be back to normal as it is now. I think it, I don't want to scare mongrel at all, but um, the fact that we got to this point is a clear signal. Uh, there has been a lot of effort going into plan change seven and um, it was quite a, um, a public process um, and we wouldn't have gone through that effort if it wasn't necessary. So um, hopefully we can provide certainty. That's the that's the, the that's the objective of the plan, really, to provide people with certainty, not about being able to continue as they are, but certainty about what the future will look like. Like what are the parameters within which people can work? That's my yeah, my attempt in trying to kind of address that issue to the best of my knowledge. But it is, you know, I cannot predict what it's gonna look like. It starts with the outcomes that we want. It starts with the discussion today, really. Yeah, you know, I guess uh, just building upon George's question there, um, farmers are doing what they can. Um, how's yeah. that being reflected? Um, things are getting out of hand. Um, water, water usage, Hiwaki Ekanoa, uh, that sort of stuff coming through. And I guess, uh, how, so how does that fit in the discussion around the land water regional plan? Yeah, I mean, um, and I, I don't want to pick an example, um, but we have got a clear, uh, a very clear mandate um, to stop degradation and uh, to meet national environmental bottom lines. Um, that is something that, that, you know, we cannot detract from. So where we see that occurring, we're, 
we're going to have to work with farmers to find solutions to that. Thanks, Solomon. Georgia, um, please feel free to unmute yourself and, and ask, yeah. ask some questions because it's, uh, I think we, um, do we need to keep recording from here, Rachel, or can we cut it off to have a bit of chat? Yeah. There might Open. be something that's there might be something that's useful to add to what Tom said there as well. Um, the you know the, the direction of the national policy statement is very clear that things need to change. Um, the other thing that it is very clear about is that there needs to be clear action plans as to how to put the changes in place, and that includes looking at I think some of the things that um, George is been referring to in terms of how you do it and how long it takes and how you actually can put a plan in place so that you can meet the requirements in terms of um, the state of the water bodies in a way that is actually going to be manageable for people. And those action plans aren't just rules, are they? Are, uh... No, and that's and so that so the, the the rules that are in the regional plan will also need to be backed by um, a package of non-regulatory type things as well. Um, and sorry, I can hand back over to you, Tom. I no, just I'm, I'm, thank you for saying that. Yeah, it's really important that you said that. Yeah, go on, please. <laughs> no, I was handing back to you as ORC in terms of that other the other things that are being yeah. I just wondered if I could just support uh, what Sandra said and, and add that dimension that I picked up from what she was saying as well, um, is that, that time frame element, the, the time frame steps to achieve. So I think um, nobody's imagining that um, if new goals are set based on uh, this foundation of Tumana or Twai, that um, things are going to have to be achieved overnight. In fact, that's what the the time frames signals in the um, RPS are showing like a you know a, a length of time to get to a place and then a, a, yeah that, that action plan to get there that is um, yeah again there's no expectation that things happen overnight you know yeah thank, thank you and uh, um, thank you Maria and Sandra and um, I, I think as well um, the time frames for the Rohe, uh, the proposed time frame is 2045, and legislation, um, not just the RMA, but actually the NPSFM requires us to be much more responsive in our plans as well. So if we see that some uh, regulatory ap approach or rule doesn't really work, um, we need to adapt. It requires our plans to be adaptive as well. So. Um, yeah, just wanted to add that. Thanks, Tom. And just uh, just going back to, um, so I'll, I'll, I'll just ask one question, Rachel, we'll come to you. Uh, I think it's important to realise that not everything in the rohe is going to rack and ruin. Uh, Hugo, have you got a bit of a sort of rough as gut snapshot um, of where we sit against those bottom lines, just reflecting the good work that is already happening? Um. Yeah, I would say that the Roxborough Road hey, most of it um it's on the green area, um so it's on the A band. Um we do have a few issues um 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 in the Teviot um river we have a few issues with um E. coli bacteria where we sit at the bottom line and then um with suspended pine sediment as well. And at the Bunger Burn, we have problems with E. coli as well, algae growing on the rivers and suspended pine sediment as well. Um, and and then, then we have, um, with E. coli, we have um, um, exceeded and in a few um, in between um, and the 95th percentile. So, because um, we, we analyze for, um, bacterial levels we analyze a, a few different parameters and then two of them it's sitting on the bottom line and for algae as well so that, uh, that's the main issue that we have for water quality in the in the in the row here thanks hugo 
George, does that answer your questions or uh, you've got some residual questions here? Sorry, Rachel. Um, I just wanted to pop in as well, just to to um, to be a bit more explicit and just say um, that that whole um, consideration of um, timeframes and how we get there um, is um, a conversation that we'll be having with communities at the next consult, you know, the, the future consultation. So I just wanted to point out that that's not something that's, that um, is being done separate to um, working with communities. So the, the points that you're making, Georgia, um, some of those things are exactly what we'll be talking to you about a little bit further into the year um, when we pull together what we understand uh, are the, the values and where um, communities would like to get to. Yeah, good point, Rachel. And I guess you've got that big 2045 target. And as you're saying, you've got interim steps to... Um, to, to um, help us get to where we need to. It's not just uh, coming in a rush. Yeah. Hey, uh, we've hit 8.30. If there are no more questions, we might jump off and have some have some dinner. Some kai. Yeah. Oh, kia ora all. Uh, particularly those of you who stuck around, you've, um, you're either very, very interested or suckers for punishment. Um, so really, really appreciate the, the opportunity to have a chat with you. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. Jane. Thank you. Thank you. Good all.